I'd like to frame the discussion with some details about Pixar. Some numbers. Since 1995, Pixar has produced 18 feature-length films. I added them all up in terms of their box office revenues, which was a real challenge because I'm not very math-oriented. Over $11 billion in worldwide box office wow. receipts with an average per movie box office uh, average of $611 million, which has by far got to be the most successful average by any movie studio in the history of the business. Finding Nemo, Finding Dory, Toy Story 3 are among the 50 highest grossing films of all time, not animated of all time, you know, live action or animation. They've garnered 16 Academy Awards, seven Golden Globes, and 11 Grammy Awards. So I think it's safe to say we're talking about storytelling in the digital era, that Pixar has been at the forefront of that, and we're really lucky to have Mary here today. So my question to you, do you ever stop and think about, in aggregate, what Pixar has managed to accomplish? I don't, and that the box office numbers there were really surprising to me, because I never, I never spend any time thinking about the box office or the marketing, but what matters to me is when People I know, my family, my friends, my neighbors, when they come up to me and say, oh, I saw Inside Out and I loved it, or whichever movie it is, that it reaches a lot of people. And I even have friends living abroad who've emailed me and responded to our movies. So mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the part that I take in. But no, as you read those numbers, it's kind of staggering. Yeah, and it really is. Now, let's start at the beginning. Your, your background's in theater. That's right. Um, could you tell us about that, how you got into that? I got into theater, my grandmother made me her theater date because my grandfather didn't like the theater. So I got to go and I was always just enthralled by it. And then my college didn't have it as a major, which actually worked out well for me because it meant that uh, it was treated like a club and it meant that I could just start directing without knowing what I was doing. And I learned by doing how to direct plays. And I went to graduate school, got an MFA at UCSD in directing. But the truth is, I didn't really love it. I just knew that I wasn't an actor. I tried stage managing, and I was not organized enough or on top of things. I was trying to find my place in the theater. And honestly, I directed because I didn't find another place. And uh, I, when I was in grad school, I, there was a program in dramaturgy. And in fact, a friend who's watching me in the green room is a dramaturg, and I started to realize, oh, that's what I really am, I'm a dramaturg. But it's hard to make a living as a dramaturg in America. If I were in Europe, I could make a, a good living in the theater that way. And a dramaturg is a person who supports the development of script, and if it's a historical play, who works with the theater company on finding the context of when the play was written and bringing that historical context to bear in the production, even if it's a modernized production. And I just fell in love with that job, but I was directing to kind of have a job. And then about 10 years into my professional theater career, I had written a program note about my favorite part of the rehearsal process. And it was all about working with the playwrights and all about the first staged reading of a play. And uh, one of the founders of Pixar uh, on the technical side, someone who created RenderMan, the um, mm. Pixar animation technology, was a subscriber at our theater. He read my program note, and I think it was a cry for help, get me out of directing. He read it and he thought, oh, this is the kind of person we need at Pixar to help develop our scripts, and cold called me and asked if I would come meet with them, and I said, I don't really like cartoons. <laughs> and I'm really glad he didn't hang up at that point. He said, well, I hadn't seen those movies. They'd made Toy Story and A Bug's Life at that point, and I didn't go see animated movies, and I didn't grow up watching cartoons. And, and I didn't mean to be rude when I said that. I was just being honest with him. And he said, well, will you just come and meet with us? And I thought, sure, I mean, I'm intrigued. So I went and rented the movies, and I was blown away. I was blown away by the storytelling. and. Frankly, the, the computer animation of it, I, I don't know, I liked it, but it, that wasn't the thing that drew me to it. I was so moved by Toy Story, and I found Bugs Life so entertaining. <laughs> and I'll tell you, one of the things that really got me, I don't know if you remember, but at the end of Bugs Life, they have outtakes. <laughs> and I was watching those you know, on my VCR back in 1999, and I was watching the outtakes and thinking, oh, that's funny that they messed up that. <gasps> 
oh, that's not an actual blooper. And I thought, these people are very clever. I want to meet these people who tricked me into thinking that was an actual outtake. I think that was the first after credits, post credits yeah. thing like that, if I'm not mistaken. It might have been, yeah. 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 And so I wanted, I just was intrigued by them, but I never thought I would work there. I had just been promoted at the theater where I was working, and I just went to check it out, and then by the end of that first round of meetings, I was completely hooked. Mm -hmm. So you were the first woman to participate in the Pixar Brain Trust. Could you explain to these folks here what the Brain Trust is at Pixar? Yeah, it's a bit of a pretentious name, and I'll, I'll <laughs> say that. That's what you refer to it in-house, right? We do. We call it the Brain Trust. Um, but w it's one of the things that I think has made Pixar successful, and it's one of the things that sets us apart from the industry. And we're not in Hollywood. We're up in a little town called Emeryville in between Oakland and Berkeley. And I think being physically removed from Hollywood, but also just having evolved separate from the industry, our working process is really different, and we don't get... Our directors don't get their story feedback from executives or from the business side of industry people. We get our feedback from each other. So the Brain Trust is made up of all the studio's directors, heads of story, and then myself and one colleague. And you know, my title used to have the word executive and I got rid of it because I don't function the way a Hollywood executive does. So that means that the people giving creative feedback have been in the creative trenches. And there's a way that, that you're able to say to a fellow artist, oh yeah, that's, that's really hard to come back from a low point after this happens to your character, and to be talking to each other as fellow artists. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a story, I think, didn't Andrew Stanton in Finding Nemo, that opening, didn't he have that place later and it was finally after the people said? The Brain Trust had to beat him up a bit about yeah, that. So yeah. what happened is in Finding Nemo, the Marlin character, we would find out, it was doled out gradually in flashbacks what had happened to his wife and all those other eggs that didn't get to become fish babies. And what happened is, as you watched the movie, not knowing where all of his fear and anxiety came from, he was just an annoying, overbearing dad and really unlikable. And he's the protagonist, even though Nemo's the, the name in the title. He's the character with the biggest arc and the biggest change. And it was hard to have a protagonist be that hard to engage with. And the, we kept telling him on the Brain Trust that he was not a likable character. And he kept saying, but he's been through so much. I'm like, well, then you've got to tell us that in a prologue. Mm -hmm. And it just made a world of difference, because then you forgave him for being overbearing with his son. And some of you might know this because I think it's on the, the DVD bonuses. And the Pixar documentary team puts so much love into those bonuses. If you haven't watched them, I, I learn a lot from watching them, even though I work on the movies. And Andrew, the root of that movie was he had been working so hard on A Bug's Life, he hadn't spent a lot of time with his son. And his son was, I think, six or seven. And he took him to a park. And he realized as they were at the park that he was constantly saying, don't touch that, don't go that high, be careful, stop. And that he wasn't enjoying his time with his son because he was so busy trying to protect his son. And he had that sort of realization that he didn't want that to get in the way of his relationship with his child. And that was the spark for this movie. And that's one of the hallmarks of uh, of Pixar, isn't it? I mean, that the directors find something that they can personally, they're, they're emotionally connected to, maybe even their, in their personal lives. Absolutely. So, for example, in Inside Out, the director, Pete Docter, he, he came up with that movie when his daughter, Ellie, and Ellie had played the character Ellie in Up and was the inspiration for the little girl Ellie in Up, and she did the voice, and that character's exuberance was based on his own daughter. And then she hits 12 years old, and she completely shut down, turned inward, started you know, covering her face with her hair. And he just was heartbroken. It's like, where did my Ellie go? And what happened to my, my daughter? And luckily, she's come out the other end of being a tween girl. But he didn't understand what was going on. And he started learning about what happens to some girls that age, feeling like they have to hold back their joy. And he decided to tell a story about a girl who has lost her joy and needs to get her joy back. Mm. Now, there's that saying, right? Write what you know, 
But I think a better quote that I've read is, write what you know emotionally. You know, write, to write something that you're, uh, you're personally connected with. Uh, I believe since Toy Story 2, uh, produce, Pixar has produced short films to go with each of the feature film releases, is that right? That's right, and we had short films. We made shorts for a decade before the first feature, before Toy Story. And in fact, it's something we're really grateful to Steve Jobs for because Steve floated Pixar out of his own pocket at a time when he'd been fired from Apple, so he didn't have a lot of income coming in. But he saw the potential, and we made no profit our first decade as a company, but we were making those short films, starting with Luxo. And so some of the shorts that we'd made in that period we used for our early films, but then when we used the ones that we were most proud of, we thought, well, we like having a short in front of a movie, and it's fun for us, and we started making shorts to go with every movie. And haven't you been intimately involved in the short film? Yes, I oversaw the short film program, and now it kind of has a, a life of its own, but I did Shepard. And my favorite, as you know, is La Luna. Yeah, La Luna is wonderful. Um, so uh, I, I know everyone asks you, I'm sure you've told me this, and people come up from LA and say, well, what's your secret? How do you do this? And um, I found this quote from Michael Arndt, who of course wrote Toy Story 3, and I think that you we surfaced, yeah, Michael, <laughs> when you did read Little Miss Sunshine before the movie came he out. He said at dinner that I discovered Michael Arndt, and I thought, I can't take credit for discovering um, a person, but I, I, read, I read a ton of scripts, and I sit down with every screenplay I read, I sit down wanting to love it. I want to be blown away. I want to be excited because I want a pool of writers to draw from. And a lot of the scripts I read don't feel thought through enough, or they, they have a lot of good elements, but they don't add up. And when I read Little Miss Sunshine, and it was well before it was produced, I just had that thrill when I got to the end of, oh, I've just been on a journey where all of the parts added up. Yeah. Uh, he's a heck of a writer and kind of a writer in residence in a way. For oh, we'd time. love to have him as a writer in residence. We can't keep him. He's, uh, <laughs> so he's writing and directing his own film now. Yeah. But we bring him in. He's part of our brain trust now. So we fly him from New York for brain trust meetings, and it's so worth it. Well, so this is where he started out his process with Pixar. He, he, a quote here, I thought they must have some foolproof system, some big Pixar story machine. But they actually just make it up each time as they go along. Pete Doctor's analogy is everybody holds hands and jumps out of the airplane with the promise that they'll build a parachute before they hit the ground. <laughs> so what's your reaction to that? Well, it's, I'll say that doing it that way, which is true, that is how we do it, is really stressful. If we could just lock a script at the beginning, you know, I'm in the first year of the process, development's the first year, and I have friends in production who, when, when we're getting really close to the ground and the parachute hasn't been finished and hasn't deployed yet and it looks like you're gonna crash, who will grab me in the hall and just shake me and say, can't you just lock the story sooner? And the truth is a, a lot of movie studios do lock a script sooner and just make that script, whether it's shooting a live action or putting it into animation. And we could do that, but we just keep pushing it. We keep finding ways that we think we could make it better and going back to the drawing board and back to the drawing board. And for the story artists, it's literally back to the drawing board. They'll draw thousands of drawings and throw them away and go back to the drawing board and redraw the movie to see what we've got. Mm. Now, that said, uh, we've talked about this too, where you do embrace those kind of classical narrative elements, hero's journey, beginning, middle, end, protagonist going through a transformation. Um, how ingrained is that in your consciousness, and you know how sort of top of mind is that when they're developing stories? Those type of classical. You know, it's funny that the artists that I work with, they don't talk academically about structure, and they weren't. Most of them weren't trained in it. They came up through animation schools um, as animators or story artists, but they didn't have that kind of literary training. But there is something very satisfying about a clear beginning, middle, and end. And it's funny because as an English major, I studied a little bit of Aristotle. And I know that what we're doing is Aristotelian. And I once said that to them. And they just kind of looked at me like, yeah, don't talk about that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> we just make a beginning, middle, and end. But they did. a lot of them did go together as a group, flew down to LA, and took the McKee Seminar. And the Robert McKee Seminar, which is somewhat satirized in the, the film adaptation, but also kind of honored at the same time. I don't know if you've oh, yeah. seen adaptation oh, yeah. in it. Uh, the McKee Seminar 
on the one hand, he's really formulaic. He's saying, all movies need to do this, and good movies should do that. And I went to the, they sent me, they had all taken it in the early days of Toy Story, and so when I was hired in 99, they sent me down to take it. And I had a lot of attitude about it. Like, yeah, this guy's going to lecture about screenwriting. And I learned so much. And I thought, OK, I'm not going to be a snob about structure. I think, actually, there's a lot you can work with. And I'd come out of experimental theater, so I was pretty anti-structure. And the plays that I like to direct tended to be nonlinear, poetic, experimental. And so I thought, well, this is so conventional. But then I started to understand that when you have a somewhat conventional structure, you can take all kind of, kinds of liberties in other ways. It gave us a lot of freedom to commit to that kind of beginning, middle, and end. Within it, we could be really playful. At, uh, Stravinsky has a quote like that. He, says, within the, 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 he was asked, don't you feel frustrated that by the, you're limited to the 88 keys of the, p the piano? He said, no, no, that defines my, my universe. Within right. that, I have complete freedom. Um, the average time, five years, four to five? Five years. Five years. Could you walk us through? Long. I mean, walk us through. There is a Pixar process. Mm -hmm. I mean, an actual development, pre-production, production process. Would you mind walking us through those steps? Sure. And I'll tell you that coming out of theater where we had four weeks to rehearse, a week of dress and tech, and then ready or not, the show must go on, you open, to come out of what was basically five weeks to five years. In the beginning, I was really frustrated. My internal clock was faster. I thought, these people, they just talk so much. But what I found is they're just rehashing and rehashing the story to try to get it the, the best it can be. And I've come to appreciate allowing that time. So the first year is development. And if it needs a year and a half, we give it a year and a half. and then. The middle three years are the story reels process. So we're not in animation really until the final year and a half. First year development, final year full production. That means the middle three years are the storyboard reels process. How many of you know what, what storyboarding is? Oh, well good, then I'm not gonna explain it. But that's the, that's the real slog. It's also the fun of it, because getting to see that rough draft of a movie up on the screen is amazing. And in our medium, the script is just a springboard. You don't really know if you have a movie yet until you sit in a theater and watch that rough draft hand-drawn on the screen. And sometimes I'll think a script is just knocking it out of the park, and we'll all be really high on it. And we watch the first reels and think, oh, we don't have a movie. All right. And you just throw it away. And you know, you might keep. You keep a few elements that are working, but you have to be willing to throw it away and start over. Those are real time? I mean, you yes, so if the, our movies are 90 minutes and our reels are 90 minutes. So the beats are, are roughly sketched. It's not, it's not like hand-drawn animation that's done with you know, a lot of care in the drawings. It's, it's really sketched. And you'll use voice people inside the? We just use people like me. We use people with theater backgrounds. It's and Ellie. Uh, Ellie was Pete Doctor's daughter. Right, right. Now sometimes the scratch voices like Ellie or the wonderful Bob Peterson who was doing the in-house scratch voice for Roz. And then we could never cast anyone in, from Monsters Incorporated. We could never cast anyone who did Roz quite as well as Bob Peterson. <laughs> and uh, Joe Ramft who did Heimlich, the caterpillar who wants to be a butterfly in Bugs. So there's times when the in-house voice sticks. Um, I was Mirage in The Incredibles, and I was really hoping it would stick because you get royalties for years. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I would say, hello, Mr. Incredible. <laughs> they didn't cast me. Um, so when do the screenwriters get involved in this process? I try to get them on as early as possible. So it was interesting. When I was hired, the directors and heads of story felt like they wanted to write their own first draft and then bring a writer on to rewrite it. And a case, you know that works when the director is Andrew Stanton or Brad Bird. They are writer-directors. When it wasn't a writer-director, having that collaborative script, it was really more of a patchwork quilt full of good ideas, but it, it, didn't, it didn't have the structure of a script. Even though they had studied the screenplay structure, it didn't have what a screenwriter brings to uh, bringing a story together, to giving it shape. And I found that when I hired a writer and they, they inherited that document, and it's supposed to be a 90-minute movie, but these scripts were like a phone book. They were so thick. 
And we're saying, well, it's a little long. No, it's way too much. Um, it made their job so much harder because they were revising something that didn't have uh, the right foundation yet. So we found that bringing them on earlier in the process, ideally, we, when the idea is chosen so that they can help lay the foundation for the first outline, the first treatments, set them up for more success to write a first draft. And when do the animators come in the process? There'll be people doing test animation in the middle of those five years, but the full animation crew is the final year. Mm -hmm. So here we are, we're an animation studio, but the full animation team is the last year of a five-year process. There's so much that goes into it to prepare for full animation. And I think it's like eight times you do these real-time reels, is that right? Yeah, and when we're struggling, it might be 10. Wow, Yeah. wow. Um, I want to talk about moments. Uh, one thing I think that, you know, we all remember movies by moments, and Pixar has so many wonderful moments. Uh, and I'd like to mention three, and just get your impressions and recollections. First of all, Up, which is, I think is a movie that we both really... Up is my favorite. Yeah, my favorite, too. Um, now, we all remember the married life montage where we all just, yes, I know, look, people, <laughs> we all remember that, right? But I want to go to another moment where Carl has succeeded in getting the house atop Paradise Falls. That's his conscious goal. And he sets the chairs up and he's by himself. Of course, he's had this argument with Russell when Kevin's been taken away. And he's sitting there with the book, the adventure book, and he's flipping through there. And he has an epiphany in that moment. Uh, could you talk a bit about, did you recollect anything about how that moment came up or evolved and what it means in the story? I can, because the, the turning, we always knew that we wanted him to achieve his external goal. And it's a crazy goal, like I'm gonna take the house to Angel Falls. And that we wanted him to get what he wanted and find out it's not what he needed. And we, but we had a scene where he got the house, he, he sat in his chair next to her chair, and then kind of experienced the emptiness of it. And it felt like that would be enough to catapult him out to realize, I need to be with this, this living relationship with Russell. And you know, he'd banished the dog at that point. And he'd, he'd lost everyone he'd connected with since Ellie died. We thought it would be enough to sit next to the empty chair. But in fact, that was just sad. It was just really sad to see him feel lonely with the empty chair. And we realized we didn't want just loneliness to be the thing that drove him to find those connections with the living. We wanted it to, to feel like it's what Ellie would have wanted. So then we had some moments where he would talk to her picture or imagine that she was telling him what she wanted and it felt a little forced. And then I think it was one of the story artists. I'd have to look back at, we, we keep reams of notes of all of our meetings, but someone suggested a scrapbook because they had been collecting um, postcards of places they wanted to go and that what if they had a scrapbook mm -hmm. and of a, a photo album of their lives and that he had stopped looking at a certain point. He hadn't looked at the last few things she'd put in because it was too emotional for him. But the idea that when she knew she was dying, she'd written on that last page, thanks for the adventure. And so when he sees that for the first time, realizing that he's been so literal about giving her the adventure of getting to Angel Falls and not recognizing that their life together had been the adventure. So it was like her giving his blessing that they'd had their adventure and he could now live his life with these new relationships. And then there's wonder, that, that wonderful little reversal of the cross your heart. Yeah. Where he looks up and says, yeah, I'll go and have a new adventure. Beautiful woman. Um, let's talk about Toy Story 3. Uh, of course, we all remember the, the, the big final conflict. They're, they're heading down toward the fire and they're holding hands and everything. But I want to talk about another moment, which is the denouement. Uh, the denouement, uh, if you haven't, don't, by the way, if you go to Hollywood, do not do what I did in the beginning and say denouement. That's not, <laughs> that's not very good. I was a reader. Yeah. So, um, but a denouement is that moment after the conclusion, basically the final struggle, the resolution, where you, you get a chance to live with the character and just see what it means to them. It's basically one minute or two minutes. What you did in Toy Story 3 was like a five, six minute segment there with Andy and Bonnie. Can you talk maybe a bit about that, how that developed? Oh, about him handing over yes, the, toys? the toys? right. That came, that's pure John Lasseter. And I think something that John does beautifully 
is he, he embraces sentiment. He's not afraid to express sentiment in a movie, but somehow it doesn't cross over into being too sentimental. It walks the line for sure, but that, um, that sense of Andy having a chance to say goodbye to each toy and honestly, some of us in the Brain Trust thought, that's long for a denouement. We yeah. thought, oh, it's gonna feel like he's milking it. Isn't the most important one Buzz, I'm, I'm sorry, Woody. You know, shouldn't he kind of hand over the others and say goodbye to Woody? But then the way it played with his, him giving that sort of loving farewell to each toy and acknowledging them as unique individuals, there wasn't a dry eye in the house. No. And it's a culmination of three parts. Of three movies. Three movies, and you had to do that. So that's an example of where Pixar can take, uh, do something different, like you were saying. You know, that's the denouement is part of a you know, classic sort of narrative structure. Let's expand it. Let's go for six minutes. We can do that. Right. If you know the rules, then you can consciously play with them. A third uh, Pixar moment I'd love to talk about is a Ratatouille, uh, which I think is like uh, not often mentioned as one of the top. It's an I, underrated movie. It really is terrific. Uh, Thank you. There you go, Ratatouille. <laughs> okay. And uh, Patton Oswalt, was he in, did he improvise any of that the dialogue at all, or was that all scripted for you him? Know, it was written by Brad Bird, but Brad knew how to write to Patton Oswalt's yeah. voice. So it's one of those where as you're working, so the actors come in and do recordings. We use Scratch for the first maybe year and a half of reels, but then we start folding in the, the professional actors. And I think it's one where as he was working with Patton, he started to get a sense of what Patton could bring to it, and then when he would write his own revisions, he was writing for Patton, just like Andrew Stanton was writing for Ellen. I mean, that Finding, finding Nemo, he wrote it for her voice before we cast her, before he'd ever even met her, and then when he reached out to her, he sent her uh, drawings of Dory and a, a character description, but he also said, you have to play this because I wrote it for you and no one else can do it. And that's how to appeal to an actor's ego. But it was true. He just had her in mind the whole time. But Patton was a real find for Ratatouille. He just brought so much heart to that character. Yeah. Um, I'd like to actually talk about a, a different kind of a moment and a different character in Ratatouille, and that's Anton Ego, the food critic, who's so hard-ass, right? <laughs> and there's a moment where he eats the Ratatouille. You, remember, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And he has a flashback. Could you talk a bit about the development of that moment and how important that was in, in the story? I think Brad had that in mind. Actually, I should be, uh, Jan Pinkova, the originator of that story, the creator of the story, had that in mind really early on, sort of the, the power of the critics to make or break the restaurant and that being a sense of conflict in the film even more than the sous chef with the big knife you know, trying to, trying to kill Rem, Remy, it was the power of the critics that was an antagonistic force. And he wanted to redeem that critic. And he used this, you know, from Proust, remembrance of things past, mm -hmm. the, there's a French cookie called the Petite Madeleine. And in this Proust novel, a character takes a bite of this cookie and it gives them a flashback, a kind of visceral flashback to a moment in the past. So Jan Pinkova was consciously using that Proustian idea. And then I feel like what Brad Bird brought to it as a director was something so cinematic in the way you, you move, you kind of pull back into the flashback, the childhood moment. Mm -hmm. And that it could be a dish as simple, because ratat ratatouille in France is a, considered a peasant dish. It's not considered fine dining. But the fact that that's what his mother made as comfort food. He'd hurt himself on the bike. Right. The comfort. And there's a great moment when he drops the pen. It's like so stuns him. It's like he's lost his, uh, that, that sort of negative crit uh, creative. Yeah. Right, he's just experiencing the food instead of criticizing yeah. it. Yeah, it's really a, a, just a wonderful moment. You know, I, never, I haven't ever thought of this, but I think someone asked me the other night, um, having been a theater director for a decade, they asked, when you go see a play, can you turn off the theater director? Can you turn off the critic who's saying, oh, you know, why, why is that stage so far upstage? Or why is the timing this? Or I don't like that lighting, right? That, once you get to know a medium really well, and you're probably finding this in screenwriting, that once you study any form, you start to 
to, it becomes more conscious and you start to notice things. And I realized when my friend asked me this that it's true that I don't usually get to sit back and just enjoy a play or now even a movie without that criticism or even in a positive way noticing, oh, that's a good act two break. But I don't want to be thinking that way when I'm audience. Mm -hmm. And I literally just came from Hamilton. I saw the matinee. I came here straight from seeing it. I walked here from the theater. And I'll tell you, that is a show where that inner critic is silent. I am just so, I was so thrilled and enthralled that I wasn't thinking I was just experiencing, which is an amazing thing as an audience member. And I feel like Ronan Ego not being able to think critically about the flavors of the food, but just to experience it, is why he drops the pen. And I think that circles us back to this topic here about storytelling in the digital era. Obviously, Pixar has been on the forefront of pushing animation. Uh, some of the, the shorts like Piper, the, the water and the wave, I mean, it's just amazing visuals. And yet, one of the things I think that I've read about with John Lasseter is he wants to know what's the universal human point of connection to the story. Is that right? I don't know how you would describe it necessarily, but is that a fairly accurate way of, of suggesting what he, what he looks at for stories? Absolutely. Um, at one point, just to remind ourselves, we talked about it as the GRE, like the GRE exam, that a story needs to be gettable, relatable, and entertaining. And relatable is the emotional piece of it. That even if it is set in a very specific place and time, that any audience member, that there's something in it that you can relate to. So that's a good object lesson for all of us. You know, the technology is great, but you know, you got to have GRE. There you go. I like that. Uh, gettable, relatable, and entertaining. Entertaining. Okay. Um, for uh, there's some several movies coming out. Uh, Coco looks fantastic. Uh, is there anything you can tell us about? I that? love Coco. I had such a good time working on that project. The, I didn't get to go on the research trips. I helped organize them and then send the team off, but they went to Mexico several times to different small villages to experience Day of the Dead. And it was it's a movie that is deeply respectful of that tradition. And we have co-screenwriters, and one of them, Adrian Molina, is Mexican-American and was very important to the whole team that we try to be culturally respectful while trying to make a movie that will be globally kind of embraced and understood. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm really, really proud of it. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to give anything away, but I will share one thing with you. After you've seen it, you can go back and there's um, a documentary, I think it's called Alive Inside. Mm -hmm. It's a documentary about how music can awaken. They take um, Walkman into, I've seen in, yeah, that into they have a dementia, right? Or, people who have yeah. dementia and how music affects them. And I don't want to say anything more, but see the documentary after you see the movie. Otherwise, it'll give things away. Yeah. Um, two sequels coming up and then some original productions. Uh, Incredibles 2, Toy Story 4. Anything you can share with us on those? I am not allowed to share anything. anything. I would, <laughs> <laughs> if I tell you, I have to kill you. Yeah, I figured I'd give it a shot, but Disney's famous, you know. So, yeah. uh, uh, what uh, four original productions in development schedule? I think it's two for 2020, one for 2021. Right, we're alternating. Um, we're doing three movies every two years, so every other year we'll have two movies out. Okay, well, that's exciting. Uh, people who have questions for Mary, you can start heading back up to the mics. Uh, I'm going to ask a, another couple of questions here. So for animation students, we have a great animation uh, concentration here, program at DePaul. How many of you are in the animation program? Oh, oh, oh great. Good. I'm glad Any you Any advice come. for uh, animators in terms of like, well, maybe not necessarily potentially working for Pixar, but just generally speaking, any advice for animators? I know very little about animation. My husband's an animator, so if he were here, he could give you advice. Uh, because I'm the first year of a production, and animation's the last year. So we really don't cross paths. In fact, my husband and I worked at the same company for years and literally didn't cross paths. We met at a Peter Gabriel concert. So it was <laughs> really, we're, such, we're in different buildings. We're in different worlds. Uh, the one thing I can say is that Pixar has an internship program that they put so much thought into. And I think about when I was an intern at the Magic Theater, I made bad coffee and Xerox scripts, and no one cared if I was learning anything. 
the Pixar internship program, they put a lot of thought into what the interns get out of it, not only what the studio gets out of it. And it's a summer program that you can apply to within a year of graduating from school. So I would, I would check that out. I think that what I'm hearing, what I'm learning is that, that the, the student programs are great and learning on the job is great, but one of the best things you can do is make your own film. And what I'm understanding about what's happening culturally is that people working with their peers to create something, and it doesn't mean that you don't get a day job, right? But even right now, full-time animators at Pixar, full-time story artists, full-time lighting TDs are working with their friends nights and weekends to make their own short films. That becomes your calling card, even within the studio. Uh, we have a, a young artist who just made a movie called Weekends, and I hope you get to see it at festivals. It is beautiful. And he made it on his own time, on his own dime, nights and weekends with friends. And I'll tell you, that within the studio, everyone's noticing him. So he, we always knew he was a very talented story artist, and people want them on their story team. But he's announcing himself as a writer-director by making his own short. Well, uh, that's one of the things we have here at DePaul. I'm sure the animation students are making wonderful animation movies. We have a short film festival oh, that's great. Uh, every year. And also live action. I, I was uh, One of my advisees came in the other day, freshman here, what, four weeks, five weeks? I said, well, you know, we got all this great equipment. We've got Cinespace and studio you know, facilities. You should be out there making a movie. He said, I already am. He's been here five weeks. He's already making a short film. So yeah, get out there and make stuff, do stuff. Uh, what about writing? Now, this is more in, in the purview of what you do. Uh, what advice would you have for writing students who say they would love to be in a situation like a, a, you know, Michael Arndt and come and work at, a, at Pixar? Do you have any general advice about them in terms of how they can feed themselves intellectually, spiritually, emotionally as writers? The best advice I can give is to echo the three women who were here before me who said, write a lot, write all the time. So Mike Arndt's a great example. Uh, Little Miss Sunshine is the first screenplay he ever had produced. He had been writing screenplays for a solid decade before one of them finally got bought. And he had become really depressed about not having anything sold. And he was working as Matthew Broderick's assistant for a long time. And before that, he was, he was various people's assistant. So he was in the industry, you know, had a foot in the door, but it, it didn't guarantee he was going to get a screenplay made. But he just kept writing, just kept submitting things. And he told me this story that when he finished Little Miss Sunshine, he felt like, oh, this is, this is the one. This is it. This is the one I feel most proud of and that all of his years of writing, and he'd written many screenplays before that, that he felt it coalesce in this one. And he said to himself, I'm going to send this out in the world, and if this one doesn't get picked up, I'm going to let it go. I'm not going to be a writer. So he sent it out in the world and got all the usual rejections. And as he got the, sometimes you don't even hear back. A lot of times you don't even hear back. Or if you, your agent kind of pushes, did they like the script? Finding out that it, people weren't responding, it wasn't getting picked up, he thought, OK, well, I told myself, if, if it doesn't happen, I'm going to do something else. So he went up to Maine in a cabin to try to decide, what am I going to do instead? I'm not going to be a writer anymore. What am I going to be when I grow up? And he came out of that weekend saying, I can't help it. I'm a writer. I'm going to go home and write. <laughs> so he went back to his you know, little New York apartment and started writing another script. And the universe provides he got that phone call. A company called Bonafide had found his script. And it was a scrappy company. And they wanted to try to make it. And they were going to make it with first-time directors who'd only done commercials. And it was you know, one of those shows that you don't know if it's ever really going to come together and happen. But just the fact that a company said, yes, we want to make your movie, was that shot in the arm You know that even after a decade of rejection? And even if he hadn't had the shot in the arm, though, what he came to is, I'm a person who has to write. Uh, yeah, he gave himself a year. And he wrote the first draft in four days and then spent the rest of the year rewriting that draft. And it almost fell out several times financially. There were some issues. Oh, yeah. It was, it's, a, it's really hard to get a film made yeah, these yeah, days. Yeah. But then it was a hit at Sundance. It won an Oscar. So yeah, it certainly, the perseverance, the perseverance paid off for him. But really, the best advice is 
just keep writing, just keep writing. Now, Scott and I met at a wonderful screenwriting festival in Austin. They do it every year in October. It's coming up. And I think that's really inspiring for students and that there's some great, there's both practical industry advice that you get from going to panels, but there's also just a lot of inspiration and a lot of great screenwriters come. I think that the blacklist is amazing. And if you don't know about it, that's something you can look up online. Um, and you know Scott writes for the blacklist. There's a lot of great information there. Um, I think that forming a screenwriting group with your peers, with people that you trust to give you frank, critical feedback. I mean, one of the reasons that Pixar works is on that brain trust. We don't pull any punches. We give each other some really hard feedback. We also try to find the, the strengths and to know how to give constructive both praise and constructive criticism. So getting that from peers that you trust, I think is a valuable thing to do. But really the bottom line is write every day, find your rhythm that has some discipline, whether you write in the morning or write at night, that you write every day even when you're not in the mood. That would probably be the best advice. Yeah. Let's have some uh, questions here from uh, the audience. Hi, Mary. Uh, first off, I want to say thank you so much for, for being here, gracing us with your presence. My inner child is screaming right now. It's really <laughs> awesome. Um, so one thing I really love and appreciate about Pixar films is I find that they have a, a sense of morality uh, and like an ethics to them. Like you always learn something from a Pixar film. And I think that's really refreshing in a day and age where entertainment is kind of becoming like junk food, no substance really. So I'm curious to know, is that something that is a part of Pixar's mission? Do you guys seek those morals, those lessons that can be remembered through your films? It's a good question. I don't, I don't think the filmmakers consciously say, they don't use that vocabulary of what do I want the moral of the story to be, but they do think in terms of what do I want to communicate to the world? What do I want the world to take away from this? When I work with a director on developing a pitch, that's the language I'll use. In my head, I'm thinking theme, message. But again, they don't, I don't want it to sound academic. And they don't receive it well academically. So I translate it to something conversational of you know, what, what's important to you. You have this platform. And it's a global platform. And if I think if you say, what's your message, they'd feel too much pressure. But if you just put it in terms of, what do you want to say to the world? And a month after someone or a year after they've seen your movie, what do you want them to remember about it and take from it and communicate with other people? Now, Inside Out, Pete Docter was exploring something going on in his own family. Now that his movie's out in the world, I have a child psychiatrist acquaintance who called me after the movie came out and he said, I now use the characters in your film as tools for my patients to talk to their parents about how they're feeling. And we didn't set out to do that, but he did say out, set out to explore something about the human condition. Thanks. That's such a wonderful moment where, where Joy rolls the memory back and she realizes that sadness has got to be a part and, and uh, she cries. Yeah. It's really, really powerful stuff and I bet that uh, uh, a, it is a great object lesson for families to be able to do that, you know, to be able to express all those feelings. And also something that changed in the course of that movie. So he had something to communicate, but he didn't know exactly where it was headed. And sometimes it helps. Like Coco, we, we found out early on where that movie was headed, and that ending became the North Star, and every decision was about what's going to serve us to get to that North Star. Whereas in Inside Out, he started off with a journey, the middle of the story, all of act two was a journey between joy and fear. And it was like three years into it that he was taking a walk and had an epiphany that this story has to be between joy and sadness. And that what he ended up making was a movie, and think about this, in this country, in America, a movie that says it's okay to be sad. Mm -hmm to embrace sadness in a culture where a lot of times the message is buck up, right? The American message is pull yourself up by your bootstraps. If you're feeling sad, take some medication, get over that. So for him to, to put that movie out there that there's a place in your life for sadness, that, that message, if you want to call it that, evolved over the process of creating the movie. So I didn't, we didn't set out to say that, but in setting out to, to explore an issue, we found something worth saying. We had a question here. 
Hi, my name is Alicia. I'm an animation major here. Um, I have two quick questions. First of all, it's nice to meet you. Um, just a little, speak a little closer to the mic, please. Okay. Thank you. Um, first question is, so how would someone like get into a job similar to yours where you're making creative decisions for like movies or films and things of that nature? On the development side, you mean? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Pixar is an anomaly. The fact that they recruited someone from an experimental theater, that's not how Hollywood does it. Um, I think that my understanding, and I've never worked in Hollywood, I've never lived in LA, but my understanding is that for a development job, you pay your dues, you start at the bottom of the ladder, you get in as a development assistant, an assistant to a development executive. They have you reading scripts. If you're good at reading scripts and writing coverage, which is your evaluation of the script, then your boss will notice that that was helpful to her or him, that your coverage helped them decide if this is a script they should spend their time on, and you might get promoted. There's a, there's a ladder down there of uh, junior development exec, senior development exec, director of development, VP. We don't have that ladder. I'm in the same job I was hired to do 18 years ago. Um, but I think that in, in the industry, that's there is a, a clear ladder for it, and that I think the training for it is really, it's a lot of English majors and lit majors who get into becoming development execs. Okay, and then second question is, like, hopefully you've changed your attitude on cartoons since you were younger. <laughs> I have, I have. And so I was wondering where you see the direction of like the American animation industry headed right now. It's a great question, I'll be honest. It's not one I've thought about a lot. Um, I can tell you that when I go to Sundance every year, yeah. I go to Scout Writers, but I'm blown away by how much animation has expanded, there's the vocabulary of animation, the different kinds of stories being told, that there's now some you know, very serious dramas being told in animation, feature length dramas. I'm blanking on the name, but there's an Iranian woman who did a beautiful hand-drawn animated feature. Is it Persepolis? Yes, yes. I mean that. Back when I said I don't like cartoons, I didn't know that things like Persepolis would exist or already, that things like that already had existed. One of the things I love about the animation uh, spotlight, they call it, the series at Sundance, is I see things now like sand animation, where they, there's a sand on a glass lit from underneath and you move it with your fingers and it just, it's mind blowing what, what can be done now. And, of how it's expanded. But I also have learned to appreciate my son thinks Tom and Jerry is the funniest thing in the world. I don't find that funny. I don't. But when I hear him in these peals of laughter, I now appreciate the whole gamut of animation. Where it's going in the future, I think that I, I'm proud to say I think Pixar's part of adults realizing animation can be part of their entertainment menu. So it feels like it's expanding to broader audiences and also then some more niche kinds of animation for specific audiences. That's the best I can do on that one. Thank you. Okay. Have another question? I think we do, yes. Hi, how you doing today? Hello. Tonight? My name is Miss Lips. I'm from Chicago, Illinois, South Side. And I'm a creative director for Holly Tunes and Stupid High. Um, my question is, I'm collectively working on a project with um, animation um, that will be intellectual property for kids um, from ages from two to 10 to teach them how to behave in a um, school and how to behave in workplace or, or getting collective ideas. So I'm trying to get this project um, written collectively with my friends and family because they uh, work in education. So the question is, how do I work that from intellectual property to keeping it more so, not hood, but where kids in the hood can understand? You I know. think you, you brainstorm with teenagers who understand what it felt like to be a kid in the hood, and you're not gonna, writing collectively is really hard. So what I would recommend is you brainstorm collectively with people who've lived the experience. You record it, you gather it, you gather that information. 
and then get yourself a writer to pull all those pieces together. I mean, I know that there's some amazing theater pieces that are devised collectively. Like I know Mary Zimmerman here in Chicago is phenomenal at doing that. But I feel like you want someone, and that might be you, but you want someone who is capturing all of these stories and ideas and then, and then giving it shape. But in terms of making it speak to a, a certain demographic, right. then you get the adult and teen versions of that to, to reflect on what might have been useful to them as kids. Like, like in a case study, something like that, or psychologists? Or? Yeah, we do a ton of research at Pixar. So for example, for Inside Out, you know, we're trying to figure out some things about tween girl psychology. We're down the street from Cal Berkeley, so we brought psychology professors, we brought neurologists, we brought in child therapists. We, we did a lot of that kind of research to get the input. But the most useful research was bringing in some 11 and 12 year old girls and asking them what it's like. What are they going through? What are they thinking about? Okay. That was more valuable than the academic research. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Do we have any more questions? Here. Hi, I'm Jacqueline. I'm a film and television major here at DePaul. And um, my question is, what, like, what does your day-to-day -day look like at Pixar, and what is your favorite part of that day-to-day? -day? Mm. Oh, great question. <laughs> It's interesting because my colleagues, most of the 1,400 people who work at Pixar, all of them in production work on one film for five years. I could not do that. So what I love about my job is we have six films in development right now in various stages. Some directors getting ready to pitch ideas in the sort of blue sky phase of what do I want my ideas to be? And then some that are just launching into their first set of reels. And what I love most about my job is that in the course of the day, I might work on three different stories. And it kind of, I feel like it keeps me nimble. It keeps me the shifting gears and getting my head around where this project is and what kind of feedback they need. And one of the things I've gotten better at over the years is in the early phase of a project, don't give dialogue feedback. That's all going to change anyway. The dialogue's the wallpaper. But when something's heading into reels, then I start giving that more specific feedback. And, to the, the challenge of giving the right kind of notes at the right phase is one of the things that I enjoy most. And frankly, the thing I love most is working with writers. So I hire the writers from outside the studio, but bringing them in and kind of helping them find their way in our process is my favorite part. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, you know, I think it's fair to say that uh, historians, when they look back on this generation in the last 20 years, there may be some who would say it's the Pixar generation because they grew up with these movies. I mean, I, uh, they, they've, not only the children, but the adults, the, you know, Pixar, the four quadrant thing, male, female, young. And so I think uh, what I'd like to do is just thank you for being part of Pixar. It's been a lot to me thank personally, you. my family. I'm sure it meant a lot to you. And so if you wouldn't mind maybe giving a big round of applause for Mary. Thank you. Thank you.